now. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Kevin, I'm the programming director here at the Photo Alliance. Thank you all for coming. Um, I have everyone muted. So if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand or talk in the chat box and uh, I'll interrupt Joseph in the meantime. But um, yeah, go ahead and get started. Joseph, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, um, so I'm uh, Kansas City originally. Um, after living in Kansas City, I moved to Chicago and did wedding photography there for several years with a photographer named uh, Jay Gerard. And in 2011, I moved to uh, New Orleans uh, to move in with an old friend of mine, an artist. And so we had a house full of artists and uh, wanted to come see a new city and, um, you know, take some new pictures, see some new things. And like so many people, the story has been told an infinite amount of times, kind of fell in love with the city and, you know, stayed ever since. Uh, I just recently, right before the, um, what do you call it, the pandemic, uh, opened up a gallery at 622 St. Anne, which is about a, a half a block from Jackson Square. So if you're interested in seeing any of my work that doesn't have to do with, you know, old, uh, oh, we got to turn on the, uh, there we go, um, old kind of you know, historical found photos, uh, and, you know, kind of more modern contemporary stuff. Uh, it's at that gallery. Uh, so yeah, um, that's me. So what we are going to do is uh, to give you a little bit of backstory about the project. Um, the project started, well, so let me, let me back up even further than that. Initially, um, my, my dad and I, we love to go to, uh, to do antiquing, um, go to thrift stores and things like that uh, at a very young age from probably like 11 or 12 starting. Uh, my big hobby was taking pictures, obviously. But in addition to that, when we would go to these antique stores, I don't know how many of you antique or are into thrifting. Um, but once you really start to get into it and find like a specific niche of things that you're looking for, uh, especially with, you know, like uh, whether it's woodworking tools or cameras or, you know, old lanterns from like the railroad days or old keys or locks. Once you start to, to hone in and look for those things specifically, you start to learn a lot about them, about a lot about them really specifically. So cameras are where I started and I collected them for probably 10 or 11 years. Uh, and a lot of them were actually on display at the gallery. That was kind of my my thought as a young person was that I'll collect these cameras and one day there'll be a cool display for uh, you know for a gallery that hopefully you know I'll be able to to run. Um, so that that came to fruition. You can't see them now because we're all boarded up. Um, what ended up happening with that hobby is that there's a, you know eBay came around and all kinds of online sales platforms, and so you have these uh, you know these beautiful old cameras that I was collecting. Uh, but now with, you know, eBay and things like that, well, you have this, you know, this camera that was made in the 70s, and it's really worth about like five, you know, 15 bucks, something like that. Um, somebody online bought it for $65. And that started happening with every single camera that you could ever find in any store. So the price of those cameras, you know, went up astronomically. And, you know, I used to have a, a kind of rule of thumb where I wouldn't spend any more than 20 or 30 bucks on a camera, no matter how cool it was. So I kind of had to stop that hobby, but uh, my dad and I would still go to, you know, antique stores and, um, you know, look around. And so I had to find a new thing to collect and um, basically stockpile and hoard. And one of the things that I found, you know, that goes obviously right in line with photography, um, you know, is people's photographs that are either, you know, family shots or taken by a professional, um, you know, that kind of thing. The beautiful thing about um, going to, uh, sorry, I'm going to go out of, yeah, yeah go ahead. Make that big? Yeah, 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 sorry, uh, good call. So I'm going to step out of frame and start showing you a couple why I give you some more of the history here. Is that big now? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so the new hobby was to go there, um, you know, and start looking for these old photos. And one thing that is really awesome about, uh, collecting them that I started, sorry, I'm still trying to kind of figure, okay, there we go, that I started to find out, um, 
you know, that really didn't occur to me at the time was that even though these photos are extremely old, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that uh, stay constant throughout. People love to take pictures with their children. Uh, people love to take pictures with their brand new car. Uh, people love to um, take selfies. Um, and I, I just found it like so fascinating. Um, the other thing that's awesome about this as a hobby that I found with, uh, uh, with antique stores is that nobody really collects them. So that if you go into any antique store, so this is, this is an interesting one. Um, I have very few color ones. I mostly, sorry, I got to try to, uh, there we go. I mostly collect, uh, black and white. Um, I try to, just because it's, it's available to me, I try to stay away from retro. Um, I mostly look for vintage or antique. Um, I love this one. She's just got that kind of like honorary look like she's just going to be amazing later in life. Um, so yeah, so what I did was uh, started to collect those. Um, you'll notice, uh, let me pull another photo here. On the backs of most of them is where they'll have the prices. Um, the prices range anywhere from a quarter a piece to, you know, 12 or $13 a piece. Um, one thing that anybody who goes antiquing and collects will know uh, is that all the prices are uh, up for negotiation. This looks like either somebody fishing, there it is, somebody fishing, something like that. Um, but all the prices are negotiable when you go to an antique store, you know, within reason. Sometimes you'll have people who, the price is the price, um, but so with photographs, because every antique store usually has, you know, upwards of, you know, 500 to 1,000 photographs, um, I will always, always buy them in bulk. And, uh, you know, not everybody has the time for this, but whenever I go antiquing, I'll spend two or three hours inside of just one antique store uh, because there are just so many thousands. This one actually has silver on it. I'm not sure if the camera is going to pick that up. Um, but yeah, so I will always try to do bulk buys and say, okay, well, I understand that you guys want, you know, five bucks a piece for these 10 types. What if I get 50 10 types? Um, and then usually you can get the price down by, you know, 25 or 50%. Um, the other thing, if you, if you do decide that you want to, you know, start antiquing and looking for these things. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, the folks who run antique stores, they, they actually care about antiques. Like they, they don't do it as a, you know, they, they do it because they care about it. It's not something that they have to do for their nine to five. Typically speaking, that's not always the case. Um, so whenever you go to someone's booth, you know, you'll see, you'll see on the photo, it'll say, uh, so like this person, they are booth 105. So if you see like a certain type of photograph, uh, you can say, hey, booth 105, like who is that? Are they, are, do they live around here? Who are they? Uh, and the person running the antique store will almost always know uh, who the person is. And in a lot of cases, they'll call them, uh, which is what I'll do a lot, where if I find, um, so here's one. This is a World War II photograph of, uh, here, let me, sorry, I need to make it bigger. This is a this is a first for me doing this, so you'll have to bear with me for a little bit. Um, so this is a World War II photograph um, that I found, and I found probably about uh, and this is uh, this is Vietnam. These are from the same vendor, and an I'm sorry, y'all. This is not easy to get them right where they need to be. Okay, there you go. But yeah, so this is from the, the same vendor. And when I saw those, I noticed that they had probably two or three huge boxes uh, of photographs that were all war related. Uh, and so I knew instantly that I had somebody who collected war photographs because one of them was from Vietnam, one of them was from World War II. Uh, they were almost all American soldiers. Uh, so, you know, I imagine that that was kind of their specialty, which when you get into antiquing, people have their, their special things, like their, 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 their kind of niches, so to speak. 
Um, so I knew that I had somebody who was a collector. And so I had the, the, the person who was working the antique store, see if they could call them uh, and, and see if they had more. Because a lot of times when you, when you, when you see a booth and you'll recognize it as time goes on and you, you can kind of see what people's collections are. A lot of people just have big boxes of stuff, nothing is marked. But when you go to someone's booth and they have everything categorized uh, and, and they're, they're a collector, they're, they're, they're genuinely putting together a collection. So when I see something like that, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll ask if I can either get the number of the person whose booth it is or if they can call them. Um, and I would say like eight times out of 10, they're super excited to get the phone call and they will just go on and on forever. And they will even bring down stuff that's at their home collection that they don't bring out. Um, so yeah, so that's just kind of a real, real brief uh, summary of, you know, kind of getting into the hobby. Um, so what we're going to start with now is I'm going to go over uh, some software um, that we're going to use. Um, let me, let's see here. There we go. So the model of scanner that I have is, let's see how easy this is going to be. There we go. Oh, I lost my diffuser. All right, there we go. Okay. So let me make this big again. And of course it's upside down. There we go. So the scanner that I'm using uh, is an Epson Perfection V600 photo printer. Uh, there's a lot of different models. And at the end of the day for what I'm doing, I don't really need anything particularly fancy. Um, this particular scanner though, uh, it, it is, I wouldn't call it fancy, um, but it is definitely, uh, can, can handle everything that, that I want to do. Um, I do um, color transparencies. I do obviously uh, flatbed, which this is reflective because it's not, you know, the light is not going through the photo. It's actually, uh, it's actually reflecting off of the surface. Um, but when you buy this, uh, it actually comes with, oh, am I still on? Okay. Um, it'll actually come with a, a slide, holder. Uh, it's also got a uh, spot for negatives. Um, you can get a larger format here. That's the two that it comes with. If you are a person who shoots four by fives or eight by tens, uh, that uh, is, is absolutely something that you can buy online. What these do is... Joseph, your um, phone screen uh, froze. Okay, let me restart it here. Hang on just a second. Sorry. We back on. Yep, we're good. Okay. Um, oh shit. Or shoot. Sorry, I don't know. Um, okay. So yeah. So if you're doing, if 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 you do buy one of these scanners, um, and you're just doing reflective surfaces, you maybe don't need a scanner that's quite like this. Um, I'm a photographer, uh, and so I like to have the options to use different. Uh, uh, different formats. Um, so that's why I have this particular scanner. Uh, I will say Epson comes with great software right off the bat. Um, just called Epson Scan, uh, pretty basic. There's also another option, which is ViewScan. Uh, at the end of the day, in my, my personal opinion, um, this really just comes down to a matter of your preference. It's, uh, if you're a Canon shooter or an Icon shooter, uh, like, a, you know, as long as you're, you're getting the results that you want, um, I don't think that it really matters uh, too terribly much. Um, so the first one that um, uh, that I got that uh, I've already scanned in, we're going to do a couple of live scans. Um, this one also has silver in it. That's why it has a really pretty extreme. Anyway, so you've got two clowns uh, holding, you know, some kind of acrobat up upside down. Um, I love this kind of stuff. These are some of my favorite photos to collect just because they're so bizarre. Um, and it's such a strange, a strange time and place to capture. Um, so the Epson, the Epson scanner that I'm using has what's called ice technology. And ice technology is basically, uh, if you have old negatives or old photographs, um, it will take out the noise or do its best job of taking out the noise. Uh, a lot of people like to use this right out of the gate. Uh, I personally, when I scan stuff, 
I like to scan it with no color correction, no sharpening. I like for it to just be completely flat to get the most, basically whatever the sensor is seeing is what I want it to show me. Um, I know that everybody has different experiences with Photoshop and different levels of knowledge. All of that stuff can be done in Photoshop or Lightroom. Um, one other reason that I don't like to add unsharpening or, um, or the ice technology, and it's different depending on different applications. So this first one right here, let me know if you guys can see what I'm talking about with the, uh, you're there, still, first one. Is still maximized. Oh yeah. Okay. Sorry. Gotcha. Okay. So this first one here is this photograph that we just, that I just held underneath the, uh, the camera. Uh, this one that my mouse is going around, that was scanned with no enhancements, no color correction, uh, nothing at all like that. And you, you know, you'll see like all kinds of like spackling and scratches and things like that. The one that's underneath was with the ice technology and it varies from image to image. This is just an example that I used because it was really dramatic. If you look right here, it looked over here and tried to say, okay, there's something funny going on here. I'm going to try to fix it myself and did a really poor job. It does a really great job for a lot of things. Um, right here is another example. Like I'm not sure what it was trying to fix. Um, this is part of the reason that I always like to do it myself. Um, so let's see here if I go back to, so this is the unaltered uh, version of this. Um, so this, this stuff that's going on right here doesn't really bother me very much because a lot of that is grain. Um, but say for example, like on the nose here, you have a little scratch going down this way here. Uh, those are, those are not things, um, that are, uh, that are part of the photograph. They're not supposed to be part of the photograph. Um, so whenever I get the scan, it looks like this. Um, one other thing that I always recommend, which, you know, we'll go back over this when we actually do a live scan. Uh, you'll notice that you've got a lot of white space here in the background. Um, I always keep as much as possible because uh, I also find it really fascinating to be able to see um, the edges um, and just to get all of those details. So I could have scanned it and cropped it in so that you wouldn't see any of that. Um, I like to keep all of that, and that's very much a personal preference. A lot of people, you know, uh, will take all of that out. It's just kind of whatever works for you and whatever you want to do. Um, so you'll get an image in uh, that basically looks like this. One of the first things that I'll do um, is drop a couple of grids. And to drop a grid, uh, you'll go to View, and you'll show your rulers if you haven't. Um, also, I know that this is going to go really fast. If anybody has any questions, feel free to email me and we'll find a way to get an email at the end. Um, because a lot of this is really kind of basic stuff that is not going to be hard to describe over an email, but I'll drop a couple of grids and I don't know how well this is coming out, but there are quick question grids there. Mark, yeah, go ahead. Quick favor. Can you move your Photoshop screen to favor the two thirds of the right of the screen? So gotcha. That yeah, I definitely, I definitely can do that. With the tool How are we bar looking there? Too. Better? Can you move the Better. toolbar over? Uh, let's see. Probably uh, which toolbar? Make, this, make the um, Photoshop window smaller and then favor it to the right side of the screen so we can see the toolbar. Yeah, there you go. Oh, I see what you're saying. All right, let me lock it yeah, on. Yeah, There we go. Okay. Uh, okay, I see where you're at. All right. Yeah, we haven't quite perfected it yet, but we're, we're getting there. Okay, so I think that should show you my toolbar. Much better. Okay, so here are, here's the rulers that I was talking about. Um, and then I basically am just dragging guides. You can make them all different colors. It's kind of up to you. Um, the, the, the tutorial that I'm, or the, the instruction or whatever you want to call it that I'm giving is really more for me personally. Um, I'm sure that there's a lot of artists in here, a lot of people uh, who create their own art. This is, this is my hobby. Um, and 
this is not something that I would ever feel comfortable giving, um, you know, with the exception of like, if somebody asked me, hey, we need these shots from Ringling Brothers and, you know, Barnum and Bailey. Um, I would absolutely tailor it to be in a way that is very, uh, that, that keeps the integrity of the photo. What I'm doing is scanning in photos that I like, um, that I find interesting. This is very much a hobby. This is not for historical archival purposes. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, but the, the procedures are all the same. It's just a matter of, of how you, um, how you decide to, to use the, the image or use the software. Um, so hang on, let me pull up my layer here. Okay, so I've got my layer here and then I've got my grids. Um, so like I said, I just do a kind of quick and dirty. Um, the edges are pretty straight, they're not perfect. Um, also for the purposes of scanning in several thousand, which is you know what I do, I just wanna get them to a place where they look like I think they look and I can have them in my digital collection. Um, so that if anything ever happens to the permanent ones, I don't have to worry terribly great amount because um, I do have some kind of, uh, and yeah, we're running a lot of videos. So the processing is taking just a second. So once I get that there, um, if I was by myself and we weren't doing a class, I would actually go through and finally select all of the edges so that I have all the rips and all the tears. Um, in this case, what I'm actually gonna do is just do basically what I would call a quick crop. And I am just going to crop inside of those lines. And then it's image crop. What that's just gonna do is just take around away the background. And the background, that white background that you're seeing is actually from the scanner bed. Um, so then you have this image here and it's been cropped. So I take away the lines. That's another personal preference. If you talk to anybody in Photoshop, you will have tons of people who will always know more than you. Um, one thing that I learned really early on with Photoshop is there are, there's more, more than one way to skin a cat. People have different ways for doing different things. But right now we're at a place where we have a kind of, you know, a, a, an image that works. It, it reads well. There would be a couple of things that I would, you know, fix up um, this little blemish right here, some of these scratches. Um, and to do that really kind of, there's no other way to describe it except for a bit monotonous. Um, the tool to do that uh, for me, and there are multiple different ways, like I said, to skin a cat, is the spot healing brush. Um, it's over here, it looks like a little Band-Aid. Um, I think intentionally it looks like a Band-Aid. And I'm, I think you guys can probably see the motion graphic that's going on here where it basically tells you what it does. Um, so if you select there, um, and then if you right click, that'll go to your brush size. You can pick a different brush size. Um, the brush size that I usually like to use uh, is just slightly bigger than what I'm uh, repairing. Uh, so let's start with the area that I was telling you right here. So it's just slightly bigger. And what Photoshop is gonna do is it's gonna sample the area that you select and then an area just outside of where you select. And then I'm not sure if you were able to see that. I'm not sure how well it's picking up. It's going to fill in what it thinks like the rest of it should look like. And Photoshop actually does a pretty fantastic job of it. Um, and it's pretty, I mean, it's, it's about as simple as it's looking here, uh, which is you just highlight it and it fixes it. You do get into more kind of finicky areas right here. Um, I don't know if this will work. Let's take a look though. Um, I'm going to move the brush down. Um, the reason for that is if you use a large brush, it's gonna sample way more of it and it's not gonna know what you're trying to fix. It's, and it actually did a pretty good job for something that size. Um, but I would definitely go much smaller and do little bit by little bit. When you hit contrasting areas like this where you've got the lips and the white here, I will usually stop just before and just after those. A lot of times with, and that one was not very good. Um, a lot of times with the healing brush, it will sample that black and or white part. And then it will add black into the white or white into the black places that you don't want it to be. So I usually try to go very slow and pick 
areas that are like each other um, in tone, in contrast. Um, so yeah, so we did that little scratch there and I'm gonna go back in the history just so you can kind of see a before and after. Oops, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah so like I said, if I was doing this for archival purposes, I may do a couple of things differently. I just want photos that I can enjoy, um, which, you know, this also translates to your own photography. Um, if it's for your photography, all that matters is that your vision is getting translated, um, which is very much the case with this project because these are not going to the Smithsonian or anything like that. Um, if someone did want one for their family or something, um, I would take a lot more care uh, in being really accurate and making it in a way that they could have it forever. Um, but I have so many photos and I just want them so that I can enjoy them. That's ultimately the project. So, um, so yeah, so you have that there. Um, the next thing we're going to actually, um, sorry, I'm going to divert a little bit. So that's ultimately how you would repair a photograph. So, um, well repair that, that type of photograph. Um, right now we're going to do a quick scan, um, and I'm going to show you some of the scanning software. Uh, and then after we scan it, we'll take that photo in um, and we'll do a couple of uh, things that we just did and we'll add a couple of uh, things to that step. Also, while I'm getting it ready, if anybody has any questions or if I'm going too fast or not explaining myself enough, just let me know, okay? So, let's see here. So this is a fun one. Um, also what I love about uh, old photography, let me make sure that this is uh, big for you there. Um, even though it seems, oh, come on. Okay. Um, it, you know, it, it's, it's a little overwhelming at first and it doesn't seem like uh, you know, you can find any information about the people who made these or or anything like that. Uh, but there, there's usually on photographs, there's almost always, um, especially with antique photos. I don't know if you all can see that. You'll see it when we scan it in. Um, it's really common practice for people to put the name of their, their company or who the printer was uh, or where it came from. Here's another example. So with, with just that one little piece of information, it's really fascinating that you can Google that, per, you can Google that photographer or uh, in the case of, you know, if the family's name is on it and find really a plethora of information. Um, Google has done an awesome job of digitizing tons of academic books. I very rarely collect a, photo, a photograph and can't find out who the photographer was where they were from, what they specialized in, and like a brief history about them, which to me is really what kind of brings these photographs to life, knowing that like having a time and place of where it was. Um, not to mention that I'm, I'm sure all of you have done this at some point in your life, maybe not for some of the younger people, but um, really, really common. And I, as I say that, I can't find one that has it on the back, but it'll say, you know, this is Timmy, this was 1973, this was his first birthday. Um, real quick, an interesting thing that happened that I found at two different places in an antique store. I found this kid and I found, I found these two separate photos in different booths. Um, and I just, you know, I recognize his face. He has a pretty distinct, you know, brow. Um, and this is, uh, this is one photograph is, let's see here, Carl Tucker in grade one and in grade six. Um, and I, I love that part of, of, of the hobby, being able to find a whole box. Like I, like this is, this is someone's entire wedding. Um, and when I find series like that, 
I, I always instantly grab up the whole series because I find it fascinating to be able to look at someone's wedding, um, you know, from 50, 60, 70 years ago to find their entire wedding. Um, and then, you know, not only that, but to find the wedding photos, but then because they're in the same box and it was the same family to find basically their whole history, um, through photography. And that's, it's an amazing thing to me, um, that doesn't translate to a lot of other things outside of photography or at least the way that photography does. Anyways, sorry about the side tangent. So here's that photograph of the woman sitting on, uh, looks like a dock in the woods. Um, the reason I chose this photograph, um, it does not have a lot of contrast, uh, even though I know there's a lot of detail. Um, sorry about the camera quality, guys. This reflection is not real good. So what I want to do is scan this one in um, and get a little bit of a little bit more contrast, um, sharpen it just a little bit because it's soft. Um, so the the one of one of the things with this printer, uh, and it could very well be that there's a fix for this that I haven't found. The first thing that most people will want to do and rightfully so because it's very intuitive to just want to take the photograph and put it butt it up against the edge here um, when you do that you lose a little bit of the edges and i don't want to lose any of it so i always bring it out about a quarter of an inch um, on any side and then i open up the epson scan which is right here and when you open it up it comes just like this uh, how big is that for y'all Oh, it's not big at all because there's a video blocking it. Okay, cool. Okay. So you pull up the Epson scan software here. And when you open it up and you've downloaded it, and if you, whatever scanner you have, this is probably the Epson software that it's going to be. Um, it comes with fully auto mode, which is great. If you, you know, if this, if it's your first time scanning, I would say do it in auto mode get some results and then then you'll see, well, you know what, that color just doesn't look right or, you know, that black and white has, it looks too sharp. Okay, once you've done the fully auto and you've, you've gotten your feet wet, then I would go and I would almost, after you've experimented with lit, I would almost always go to professional mode. Um, I mean, it sounds, uh, what do you call it? Like, I mean, it sounds daunting. It's, it's very, very, scanning is very, very easy. Um, so, sorry, one more thing. This is, uh, while this is a, a monotone print, this is not a black and white print. Um, it has, uh, it's uh, sepia. Um, so this is, this should not be scanned as a black and white. So I'm gonna close the cover here. Um, so going through the tabs, how well can everybody see my tabs, Kevin? Um, we're looking at... Um, the Epson scan here. Yeah, it's... Um, it's doing, anyone can correct me, on my screen it looks a little pixelated, but if you just read what it's saying, uh, I'm sure we yeah. can get by. I'll just try to hover over here and read. Okay, so you've got your um, your settings and your name here at the top. Um, all that is is if you, uh, if you find a, a custom setting that you really like that works for, for whatever you're scanning, save it, that way you don't have to change the, um, you don't have to change the settings every time, it's just, it's a shortcut basically. Um, so right here we have the, uh, the tab that's called original. So we have reflective and film. Well, this is obviously um, reflective, like I was saying earlier. Um, so we're gonna do reflective. Um, the source is the document table. That's what this is. The scanner bed is the document table. Um, auto exposure type, you have the option of photo and document. Obviously photo, because that's what we're doing. Um, so this is where things get a little bit um, a little bit technical. Um, so you have the option for, let's see here, let's start from the top, 40-bit color. Um, so the thing about 40-bit color is that you're gonna need to save it as a TIFF file. Um, for a little four by six like that, 48-bit color, uh, in the DPI that we're gonna use, that file's gonna be close to a gig. It's going to be enormous. Uh, not to mention that if you use 48-bit, it's certainly, it's certainly gonna get you, uh, so the 24 bits, 48 bits, that's, that's in reference to um, how much color the scanner is going to pick up. The monitor that, and I, there could be somebody who has a crazy monitor in the audience, your monitor will not pick up a 40 bit color scan. Uh, however, with printing, 
your printer will be able uh, to translate that, but your monitor likely will not be able to. Um, so like I said, this is not, the, the project that I'm working on is not for the you know, Smithsonian, it's not for any, any archival purposes. Um, I still want them to be extremely high quality, uh, but I don't need four by six gigabyte files sitting all over my hard drive. It just, it's just not practical for me. So I do 24 bit color. Uh, again, it's, it's a monotone print. It's not black and white. Um, if I do black and white, you're going to lose all of that, all of, all of the color that's in there. So even though it's monotone, I still use color. Um, uh, as far as the resolution, it depends on your scanner and your software. Um, I typically find 2400 DPI to be more than enough for a print that's uh, the size of four by six. Um, kind of an industry standard, and I'm sure that there are people that will disagree with me, but kind of an industry standard is 300 DPI um, for, for prints that you're doing. So if it's an eight by 10, 300 DPI, if it's 24 by 36 inches, 300 DPI. Obviously, it's nice to have the most that you can. Um, since we can have it and it doesn't, um, it doesn't take up a, a whole lot of space, I do 24 bits and 2400 DPI. Um, you can change the document size if you want. I don't do that because once we get to the scanning, um, I crop it anyways. So we go down further. Um, this is actually what makes it really easy for me personally. You can unsharp mask. Um, which I'll show you that. I'm not going to mark it because like I said, what I like coming out of the scanner bed is as true to what the sensor is picking up as possible. I don't want Epson to do any adjustments or anything to it. I, I, I want to do all of that myself. Um, with that said, play with it. Like if you, if, if it depends on your project, if you want all of them sharpened before they scan and that's all you want done to them, there's no reason not to. It's going to save you a step of bringing it into Photoshop. Um, again, with the digital ice technology for removing scratches and dust and things, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't use that. I remove anything manually that I want. Okay. So everything is unchecked. It's going to give us, um, basically the most, um, out of the, out of the scanner. I don't, I don't know a better way to describe it. Out of the scanner experience as possible. It's not going to do a whole bunch of editing. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do here is preview. And let's think in here. Hang on just a second. Okay. So we've got a test scan here. You're not going to see very much detail on here. The, the, the purpose of a preview scan is so that you can preview where it is and make your selection. There's not going to be any detail. You're not going to be able to zoom in. So if you'll notice, whenever I scanned in, I'm not sure how well you can see it or how far away it is. Like I said, I do about a quarter of an inch outside of where the image is so that I haven't cut off anything. Okay, so I've got that. I'm happy with where it's at. I'm going to scan it in. And so here we go. Let me pull this over here. Here are your options for whatever you save it. You can go to my documents, pictures, and other. Um, for this, and, and always for me personally, um, I do other. I create a folder because I'm usually scanning in tons and tons of photos at a time. So I have this folder here created called photo scans. If you want to create something different, you can go to browse. You'll make a folder, call it whatever you want it to be. And that's where it's going to drop them every time. Um, you can use a prefix. So, you know, Joseph Walton photography, all the prefixes will be JPW. Um, and we'll even go a step further and say JPW scan so that if I'm ever uh, searching for, for scans specifically that I've made, I know exactly how to find them. Uh, all I have to do is go to a search tab and type in JPW scans. Everything is going to have that prefix. And then it's going to start with, I've already done a couple of, of scans uh, in this folder, but it's basically going to start going sequentially starting from whatever number you choose. So it's going to be JPW scan 004. Makes it really, really easy for workflow when you're trying to look through hundreds of files. Um, you could also, you know, add a year to them, but at any rate, that's, that's your own workflow. However, it's easiest for you to find them. Um, I go with JPEG. Um, you can also, you have a ton of different options. Um, TIFFs are largely regarded as some of the best files. Uh, they are massive though. That's, that's part of the thing. Um, so I choose JPEGs for the project that I'm doing. 
um, if you if you want something that you know you can hand to the New Orleans Historic Collection, probably better to use the largest resolution, as many bits as you can, and as a TIFF file, um, just so that it's what what, I, what what you would call future proof. Um, who knows what technology we'll have in the future, and you want you want to use the best settings that you can possible, so that moving forward in 20 years, if that photograph's destroyed and all we have is a digital scan, um, you have that. Um, not really for my purposes because this is, you know, very much a hobby for me. Um, okay, so we've got all of that. Uh, all of this will come up um, automated. Uh, I like to leave it how it is because it works for what I do. And then we'll hit continue. And this is, um, I call this the, 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 good, um, the good warning window. It basically says your, your resolution is extremely high that you've chosen. It's going to take a while to scan this. Uh, you know, don't let that scare you too much. It's not really going to take that much time. Um, but while it does, I am going to show you some more photos. Oh, did I? Uh, there we are. Hey, Joseph. You're not missing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you want to open it up for questions real quick. To, uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Either. Yeah. Anybody who's got questions. Yeah. Then um, if you want to show us what else you want to do with the scan and then um, kind of go through your photos. We're looking, we're past 30 minutes already, but we still have Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, anybody who has any questions, just let me know. And I'll, while, while I'm answering questions, I'll hold up some photos that I have. Uh, Kevin, I don't hear anybody, by the way. Any, I don't know if there's anybody who has any questions or anything. If anyone has questions, just type it in the chat. So what these are is these are actually, uh, I found somebody who had a booth in the Smoky Mountains. Um, it was an outdoor antique shop. Um, so all these photographs were actually just outdoors. Um, and I, this guy had a great collection and I went and found him and I said, well, you know, do you have anything else? You have some really interesting photos. He said, well, are you into wrestling? And I said, I absolutely am into wrestling. Um, he said, well, I have a whole bunch of old. And so these are unfortunately have been backed on um, backer boards, um, which is just a piece of cardboard. Um, I could probably have them removed, but I think it would do more damage than, than good to have them removed. Um, but he sold me his whole collection of, uh, of wrestling promos. So basically what somebody would have done with this is that they would have used this as promotional material. They would have sent this around the country, um, as you know, just how tough they are and how they look, uh, and gotten wrestling matches that way. Um, that's one of my, definitely one of my favorite collections of photos. Um, sorry, I'm still listening if anybody has some questions. So the scan has about two more minutes left. Uh, let me show you a couple of uh, unique ones here. Well, they're all unique. Um, these are tintites. Uh, let me make sure that that's still big for you. Okay. So these are tin types that I found. Um, I bought these in bulk. I think they wanted like 30 bucks a piece for them. Um, but like I said, if you go and you always buy in bulk, they're gonna help you out. So you'll notice that they are very reflective. And somebody has painted matte over the top of this um, just to make them pop out more. Uh, I imagine at one point that was a fashionable thing to do or maybe a style of that specific photographer. Um, you'll notice on this one, if I rotate it really slowly, this photographer has actually painted, let me get even closer if I can. He is actually, or she, whoever the photographer was, has actually painted in the beard and the suit. And really the person's face is one of the only things remaining there. That's with the light reflecting it right there. That's one of the best ways that you can see it. Uh, but the photographer has decided to use a, a, a whole lot of, um, uh, Taking a lot of liberties uh, in altering it, which uh, to me it doesn't bother me at all because I'm it, it, I like it from a historical point of view. And if somebody was doing that at that point, um, that's great. This is actually so. This is a fun one. Um, I don't know if y'all can recognize that person. Um, that's actually me. Uh, I believe, and I may be wrong. If somebody knows, please let me know. But I believe this was taken by Bruce Schultz at Scott Edwards Gallery. 
um, in the French Quarter, uh, Scott Edwards has a gallery on Decatur Street. Uh, and so Bruce Schultz was doing um, prints and I went home and I got uh, a turtleneck, um, a knit turtleneck and did my Hemingway pose, which was a blast. If, if he ever comes to New Orleans, like you have to go do it. It's so much fun. I may be wrong about the price. I want to say it costs like 40 or 50 bucks for this print. Um, and it is, I think it's the same type, I'm pretty sure. Um, but it's printed on metal and it looks amazing. It really, seeing it on the camera doesn't do it justice. But if he ever, if he ever does another thing at Scott Edwards, you have to go do it and get some old tiny clothes. It's, um, it's a blast. Isn't there, Joseph, someone at the market who's doing that? I think so. I think actually uh, Cricket, Cricket is doing that. Yeah, um, I don't know Cricket's last name, um, but like I said, if we if 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 there's a way for me to gather emails from people, I'll get, I'll do a little resource page that I can email out to people. Great. Um, so our scan's done, so we are going to open it up here, and there we are with Photoshop. And the other thing, if you don't have Photoshop and you have Lightroom or a lot of these programs are essentially doing the same things. I prefer Photoshop. It's what I grew up using. It's what people have taught me about. Um, as long as it's getting the job done in the way that you want, you know, don't let anybody say that you need like a, a specific program or, you know, a specific thing, because at the end of the day, we're all creatives. And as long as you're getting the result that you want, that's really all that matters. Um, Cause especially with the internet, I know everybody's been on a forum no matter what you do, someone is always going to tell you that you're doing something wrong or incorrect. Um, you know, just do what you can to get the, the results that you need. So this okay, one, your phone screen is oh, still, go ahead. Still, do what? Your phone screen is still up. Ah, oh, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, I got to figure that out. Okay. So there we go. So like I said, now we're back in Photoshop. Uh, how do we look there? Okay. So again, here we are with this tool, the spot healing brush. With photo restoration, it's, it's probably, I would say, arguably the tool that you'll use the most. And all I'm doing is one click. I'm not dragging it. I'm just doing one click on these little areas here, this little line going here. I'm going to actually make my selector smaller, move it across. And sometimes it does exactly what you want. Sometimes it doesn't. So like it left a little bit there and left a little bit there. Okay. So that's just going back and showing you a little bit more of that tool. So um, this is just rotation, image, edit, rotate. I want it to be clockwise. Um, so like I said, with this one, I wanted to add a little bit of, um, just a little bit more, um, a little bit more contrast. So sorry, I went a little bit fast for that one. Image, uh, just brightness and contrast. Um, and I do try to keep them as true as I can, but again, these are for me and I want them to be more enjoyable for me, uh, when they're edited. So I added just a little bit of contrast. Um, for me personally, the trees, I would, I would really like to have just a little bit of punch in some of these whites. Um, so I am going to go to levels, uh, and this is your, uh, your histogram right here. Um, so this, this side is your uh, dark slider, your white slider, and your midtones. Um, there are an infinite amount of tutorials about how this tool works uh, and different theories or philosophies on how it should be used and how it shouldn't be used for photos. Um, I am just going to bump it up just the slightest. Um, while I do that, look right here is where you want to be looking. So you've got kind of a neutral, and I don't want it to be crazy like it is from a different time period, just, just a little bit. And I'm gonna do a before and after so that you can, it's just that, and I'm not sure how well that's translating, but it's just that little tiny bit right there. Um, so the last thing for scans that I wanna show you um, is like I was saying, I don't, I, I don't like to let the scanner decide how sharp an image needs to be or how sharp it doesn't need to be, um, especially because if you're using Photoshop or any photo editing program, it usually has that option. So I'm gonna to go to sharpen, it's under filters. Sharpen, unsharp mask. Um, and it will give you a preview in this box. This is a zoomed in view. 
what I usually like to do is actually zoom in to the image because it will also give you a preview of that. Um, so I usually move the radius quite a bit down because I don't want it. Uh, I, I don't want it to be um, really, really dramatic. So I'll move the radius down um, somewhere like it, somewhere in between like 0 0.1 um, and maybe like 1.5. Uh, and then you can adjust the amount um, in your preview right here. Let's move this up just a touch. Um, I normally wouldn't do this much. I'm only doing it so that you can actually kind of get an idea of what it's doing. Um, let's see here. Hang on. Okay. So do you see how whenever I click on it and click off of it, the whites are really, really bright? Um, I'm only using something that dramatic just so that I can, for just, you know, for explaining purposes, um, but that's essentially what it's doing. Um, you can get really, really dramatic with it, um, and it, and it starts to look just completely fake. It looks like, I mean, it looks like something that's just been rendered in a computer. Um, I try to be as subtle as possible, but if something is out of, not necessarily out of focus, but if something is not as sharp as it could be, and I want it to be tack sharp so that I can enjoy it more, um, that's definitely what I'll do. Uh, one last thing, and this is a really easy one. Um, so you've got your image here. Like I said, I scanned this in uh, as a color scan uh, so that I would get these really nice uh, sepia colors. But you know, if that's not for you, um, there's a really easy just adjustments, desaturate. You can see what it looks like as a black and white, um, which is also nice. But for me, I want it to be as close to what the person was taking as a picture of as possible. Um, I have a question. All right, uh, what you what you got, Kevin? So, um, when you get a photo like this, was it originally a pure black and white photo, or how has it eventually gone to this sepia tone? So it it depends. It, well, it depends on the photo. Um, this this little kid with this smirk is a uh, here. Let me go back. So all photos, uh, sorry, there we go. I mean, all photos over time, um, I mean, it's just part of, part of aging. They'll all discolor over time. Um, uh, a photo like this, you'll notice that this one is whiter. Usually what that is, is, is from is the fixer that was used in fixer. Um, you know, whenever these photographs were, were developed, uh, fixer is this kind of, for black and white photography, this kind of middle step. Um, and if it's fixed really well, and the fixer is fresh, it'll be bright white and stay white for a long time. Um, if, I'm not sure if you can see the difference in those two. Now this, I mean, this is an arbitrary example because I don't know what year either of these were shot in, but it's just kind of an example of this one, um, has a, a lot more deterioration, um, and that's that's because of Fixer. Um, one more thing, really quickly, and this is just uh, kind of types. The reason photographs were taken, or the the types of photographs. Um, so you'll see this. That's really light. Okay, you see him, um, and on the back, it's actually a postcard, which are some of my favorite ones, and it's really quite hard to see. Sorry about the video, y'all. It's not uh, my first time using video in this way. Um, but at any rate, it is a postcard. Um, so you'll find different kinds of postcards. People will either take a piece of cardboard uh, and they will glue, oh, sorry, they will glue a photograph to the postcard. Um, or some of the better photographers or maybe the more, um, I don't know, uh, more cutting edge ones will have postcards that were printed on the back. They were printed on the back and then on the front had photo emulsion um, so that they didn't need to stick a photo to cardboard. Um, so it's, just, it, it, it's very interesting. I will, uh, one last thing that I will say whenever you're um, going to antiques or something that I've seen in the past year that a lot of vendors have started doing, um, is taking really famous old photographs 
and printing them with inkjet printers and charging like a dollar or two a piece. Um, if you go to a booth and you see somebody who has 50 photographs of uh, like Parisian nudes, they're almost definitely fake because they're, those are super expensive, super rare photographs to come by. Um, I've been doing this for like 10 years. This is probably the only nude photograph that I've ever, um, that I've ever encountered that's not a reproduction um, and is an actual, it's an actual photograph. Um, so when you, when you go in, you know, do try to do a little bit of research as far as how to look and see what a, what a real photograph is. And it, and it can be hard. I mean, it can be hard sometimes, but there are definitely people in antique stores printing out these old, really amazing photographs, but they're, they're just inkjets. Like you can, you could just go on the internet and print those yourself. Um, so do keep an eye out for that. Um, usually it's really easy to tell which ones are legit because people, oh, come on. People love to write the information about their kids on the back um, and what they are, where they were taken. Um, so that's really a good first line of defense to find out um, is to look on the back. Like this one is dairy print. Uh, actually, no, that's just the type. Um, but at any rate, usually on the back, it will have the photographer or there'll be like a stamp, a stamped seal. Um, so that's a really good way to determine if it's a photograph that you're like a, a traditional black and white silver tin type that you're buying or if it's a reproduction. So just keep that in mind. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Joseph. This is yeah. Thank you all. And um, totally been great. yeah, Kevin, will you send uh, an email uh, if anybody has any questions um, with my email address? Yeah, totally. Well, before you leave, does anyone have any questions? Uh, just either uh, you can add a reaction if you select reactions on your bottom panel, raise your hand, or you can just type it in the chat really quick. Otherwise, I'd like to remind everyone. Lisa posted it in the chat. Um, we just are, uh, our, oh, sorry, our grants are open. Uh, so we have the Michael P. Smith grant is open for applications. And, um, also this is an ongoing series called Quarantivity. Uh, follow our Instagram and Facebook and our newsletter and you'll see what's going on soon. Um, we're going to have Brian Piper, who's a curator at NOMA, uh, on Tuesday this upcoming Tuesday. And um, he's gonna be discussing our next open call, our open submission uh, for the Photo Alliance. And uh, yeah, we have some really great stuff. Joseph, you wanna talk about the lenticular thing? Yeah, so I actually, um, because of the, um, the pandemic, I've actually had a lot of time to be experimenting with things that I normally wouldn't get to. Um, just to give you a real quick taste of what I've been doing now, um, this is called lenticular printing, and I'm sure you've seen them. If you buy uh, baseball cards or Pokemon cards, um, they're, they're, they're these images that they look one way, one, like whenever you hold them in one angle, and then as you tilt them, they change into something entirely different. Um, this is actually not a special kind of photo paper. Uh, there's, nothing, there, there's nothing special about the way that it's printed. The only thing is there's... Um, uh, there's, uh, what do you call it? Um, it's kind of like mountains and valleys that, that go up and down that are, that line this so that when you look at it one way, you're, you, you can't see the image that's there. And then whenever you tilt it, it's a lens and focuses in on what you're looking at. Um, I, it, it's, it's not a, a terribly complicated process, but, uh, but yeah, if you're interested in lenticular printing, um, that's something that I'll definitely go in and, in, in depth on. Uh, hopefully, either um, either on my Facebook page or uh, if they have space at the Photo Alliance, uh, we may do it in a couple of weeks. We got loads of space at the Photo Alliance. We have two to 18 months for <laughs> space. Awesome, awesome. But yeah, it's a really fun process. Uh, you know, like the the one that I always think of is like the, um, the Home Alone kid where, um, you know, space is normal and then you tilt it up and he's like, so that's the kind of idea. Um, it's one image and then flips to another image. Pretty simple, but um, but if you've never done it, it's it's a it's a bit of a it's a bit of a trick to figure out how it's done. 
All right. Well, awesome. Thank you, Joseph. And thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you all very much. Uh, I'll try and get them your, their, uh, get you their emails. So, all right. Thank you all. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, take care, everyone.